cells in their extracellular matrix together f uh, form tissues, which are responsible for performing certain functions within the human body. And then as we know, those tissues will make organs and organs will make systems. If we take a look at those tissues, one of the things that they all have in common, whether we're looking at epithelial tissues, muscle tissue, connective tissue, or nervous tissue, is that the um, is really this interaction within with the extracellular matrix as well as with other cells. So I'm going to take a second and I'm going to use epithelial tissue as my example, but it's important to understand that nervous tissue and muscle tissue also have similar types of relationships, e each cell connected to each other and to the extracellular environment around it. Connective tissue is a little bit less so. The uh, fibroblast and the chondrocytes and the other cells that are found within the connective tissue do in fact interact with their extracellular matrix, but they're usually spread and uh, placed far enough apart that they don't necessarily connect directly with other cells. So if we take a look at the epithelial tissue and the way it's going to work, first let's talk the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix is going to be composed of proteins that are secreted from the cells. Connective tissue essentially contains a tremendous amount of extracellular matrix. Those collagen and elastin fibers that you saw in your anatomy class are, the, are secreted by cells. They're secreted by the chondrocytes, by the fibroblasts. Um, by the osteocytes and that matrix fills this extracellular space and between the fibers is fluid a jelly-like fluid which we would refer to as the extracellular fluid or the interstitial fluid and so if we take a look at our, our epithelial cells what we would really see and and, and I'm just going to draw a very rough diagram of these cells is we would have our cells and I'll go ahead and throw on some microvilli here and we'll start with a single cell okay and out here what I'm going to say this is the lumen and it could be because I put microvilli in there it would actually be the lumen most likely of the small intestines but if this were a, a, a cuboidal cell then that lumen could be in the renal system it could be one of the tubules that exists in the the renal system but regardless, it's, it's this lumen and it's going to be filled with fluid as well as other uh, substances that we will talk about in more detail with the digestive system. Of course, because it is a cell, we're going to have my nucleus and we're going to have my endoplasmic reticulum. We'll have both the smooth and the rough. We'll have some mitochondria in there. We have a Golgi apparatus somewhere around here. Uh, maybe some more endoplasmic reticulum and some lysosomes and what have you in terms of the organelles they're all going to be present within this cell in addition we're going to have my connective tissue and so my apologies I misspoke my um, cytoskeletal tissue and so I'm actually going to go ahead and erase my organelles now that you you acknowledge that they're in there and you saw my beautiful lovely drawing we're going to look at this connected or <laughs> my apologies i keep misspeaking but anyway we're going to look at this cytoskeletal tissue and you know of course that there's cytoskeletal tissue that are uh, the actin filaments that are going to give structure to the microvilli as we discussed and then we also talked about these i prefer to call them these belts and these are a dense filled with dense connective tissue that uh, essentially transverse the cell okay and we're going to come back to those i'm going to talk about the importance of those those belts but we also have a network of connected uh, <laughs> cytoskeletal tissue and i'm going to draw it down here and then of course we would have some all throughout the cell and then we'd have our network you know our, our spider web so to speak of connective tissue connecting the different regions of the cell. So that's my cytoskeletal. I have connective tissue on my brain. Cytoskeletal proteins there. 
Now, so the extracellular matrix then is going to be out here. The liquid portion we would refer to as my interstitial fluid, okay? And then we also have the collagen fibers, the elastin fibers, some other proteins, uh, glycoproteins, which are carbohydrates combined with proteins, uh, proteoglycans, which are also carbohydrates combined with proteins. Um, we're going to have these all out in this extracellular space. And so, yes, we've got some fluid there, but we also have this vast network of uh, proteins, collagen fibers, elastin, uh, and so forth. Let me remove my interstitial fluid. I'll put it back in a second. It's in my way. Okay, so my, my network of proteins and glycoproteins and what have you out here. And this would be my extracellular matrix. And it also generally is going to be, you, you would have heard the term in your anatomy, your, your basal lamina or your basement um, membrane. And then beneath that we would have uh, quite often areolar connective tissue. You've probably heard the, the term lamina propria. That's essentially what we're looking at here in a very simplified schematic here. And then of course the interstitial fluid would be the fluid that bathes those um, those proteins. This is just one cell. Now this cell is going to, I'm going to talk first about junctions that are going to connect this cell. We want this cell to stay in place. We want this cell to stay anchored down to something substantial so that we don't have friction just lifting these cells off and carrying them away. And so what we end up having is a network, and I'm simplifying this drawing. Um, where did my drawings? There we go. I simplifying this drawing for you to kind of give you this visual idea of it. Um, and what we're going to have is a network of proteins and these proteins are going to be, some of them will be what we call transmembrane proteins. And the trans means to go across. And so a transmembrane protein has a part of the protein, and again, please remember I'm simplifying this, but a part of the protein that is inside the cell. And referring back to those molecular interactions, this protein combines with the cytoskeleton. It interacts with the cytoskeleton. The protein has a binding site, the cytoskeleton has a binding site, and they join together. That binding site contains amino acids that will be energetically favorable for it to fit together. Both the shape and the molecular properties cause it to fit together. And so the intracellular portion of this protein connects and anchors onto the cytoskeleton in the uh, intercellular space. Okay. And then a portion of that protein crosses the membrane, okay? And you can see how I draw it across the black line representing the membrane. Now there's actually a collection of proteins at this point, but because I'm going to simplify the drawing, I'm just going to draw it as if it were only one protein. The point though is that this protein connects to something in the extracellular environment as well. And that connection, if you can think about it, as if you know a human with two hands and one hand is holding firmly to think about standing in a door frame if you will and one hand holds firmly to the door frame and the other hand is going to grasp something that's outside that's essentially what's going on with these proteins is it essentially you can think of it as the binding sites as being these hands that are grasping onto on one side the cytoskeleton on the other side those collagen and uh, elastin fibers. Um, there's a third fiber that I never can remember the name, but the they're going to be grasping onto those fibers and holding on tight to them. And what this does is is hold that protein down, or sorry, hold that cell down in place. And you can think about this. You know, if you're building a house, you're going to drive down deep into the bedrock if you want that house to be really firm and strong. Um, and anchored to the rocks below. And that's essentially what's happening here. And you'll have a number of these junctions, which I'm going to simplify here. And we are going to talk about 
the identity of these junctions and go into a little bit more about their protein structure and organization. But for right now, this visual representation should help you kind of get this in your head. Now let's add in another cell because of course epithelial cells, they're tissues, so we're going to have a number of different cells that are going to be lined up in this tissue and each and every one of those cells would be anchored in turn to that um, extracellular matrix and so if we assume that that matrix is going to continue down its way and this cell just like the other cell is going to have its cytoskeletal framework okay and here's where the um, the belt that I talk about comes into play and so I'm gonna kinda draw this in here alright this band right here and then of course we've got all the other cytoskeletal proteins running through the system here including the ones down here that are going to anchor the cell or help to anchor the cell into place and so this one's going to be anchored down to the extracellular matrix too. And then these two cells, let's take a look at them, they're close together. Depending on the job of the cell and in the intestines, if that's where we're at, the job of the cell is going to be to secrete and to absorb, uh, we're going to have different types of connections that form between the two cells. And they're going to be very similar in principle to the connections that, f that connect the cells to the extracellular matrix. The idea is the same. There's going to be differences in the types of proteins involved, but basically, just as a concept, to help you understand the concept, we're going to once again have an intracellular side, and then we're going to have an extracellular side. Okay. And then the other cell will likewise have an intracellular side and an extracellular side. And the two of them are going to be, in essence, holding hands. And we would refer to that as a cell junction or an adhesion, depending on its characteristics and properties. And so not only do these cells hold tight to the bedrock, so to speak, but they also hold tight to each other. And based on that tightness, it's going to regulate the transport of molecules in between cells. So we have two types of transport when we're dealing with an epithelial layer. One is called paracellular transport. And you're going to want to know this for the exam. Paracellular transport refers to transport in between cells. So if these cells are connected with a loosey-goosey type of connection, we can get substances like water or sodium ions uh, traveling in between these cells into the uh, basement membrane, into the other side. And so we would refer to that as paracellular transport. Now, paracellular transport is not regulated. If it's small enough, it's going to transport through that, that region there. Small water soluble molecules can get through paracellular transport in some tissue types. And there are some junctions that will prevent it. We'll get into that. The um, other type of transport that you need to know is called transcellular transport. And as the name suggests, um, that's going to be transport through the cell and so that will go directly through the cell which means anything that transports through the cell has to cross the apical membrane and you'll remember from your anatomy the apical membrane is the side that faces the lumen and it's got to pass through the basal lamina basal laminar membrane laminar or also called the basement membrane Um, and it's going to have to pass through that side to get into the um, extracellular matrix down beneath it. And so both of those concepts, transcellular, then would be through the cell as opposed to between the cell. And so those are two important concepts that you're going to want to know. Um, so if we take a look at 
the types of junctions. Let's go ahead and move on here and, and take a quick look at these junctions. And you'll want to read more about these in the book and understand them. The junctions that I'm going to talk about here, uh, the first one I want you to know is something called the tight junction. And the tight junction is often found in epithelial barriers. So if we go back to the epithelial barrier that exists in the small intestines, we don't want a loosey-goosey connection. We don't want things to just flow freely in and out across those barriers because that would actually um, prevent that epithelial barrier from providing protection against the things that we eat. Not everything that we eat is going to be good for us to absorb, and so we tend to restrict absorption to molecules such as glucose and amino acids and carbohydrates. Um, I'm sorry, glucose is a carbohydrate, uh, fatty acids, and so forth. And so that restriction is critical to the function of the cell. So we really do not want any kind of paracellular transport in a in certain epithelial tissues. So in the intestines, no thank you to paracellular transport. In the renal tubules, no thank you to paracellular transport. And so the way that paracellular transport is prevented is through these tight junctions. And what these tight junctions are shown right here is if we zoom in on them, essentially they are, you can think of them like rivets that connect the two cells so tightly together that the cell membrane of one cell will fuse with the cell membrane of another cell. And it prevents the transport of any type of molecule through paracellular processes, even water. Okay, so even water can't get through that um, tight junction. And so we see a lot of this with barriers that we have. If you think about the bladder, for example, we're going to have tight junctions. That transitional epithelial has tight junctions in it because otherwise we would have urine leaking into the interstitial fluid, which would be counterproductive. And so we definitely have tight junctions there. And there's other places in the body that you, I'm sure you can, as you think and put your uh, mind to work, you can, can see these types of junctions. Um, now the components of this is if we were actually to zoom in on this we would see a collection of proteins we would see these plates or these plaques on each side of the cell so this plaque would be in one cell and this plaque would be in another cell so cell one and cell two okay and the in-between space would be let's draw in pink this space right in here would be my this part here is going to be the paracellular space and because those two plates from each cell are so tightly welded together we don't get movement through that paracellular space. The proteins that are involved in the formation of this particular type of junction uh, include among other things uh, clodins and occludin proteins and there's uh, other proteins involved as well, but those are two of the major proteins involved there. I am a concept person. I'm not so much a detail person. So for this type of thing, uh, it's highly unlikely that I'll test you on the name of the proteins involved in this jun junction. Um, Claudin and includins is unlikely to show up on the exam, but the concept will. So I might ask you a question such as, which of the following junctions are going to prevent paracellular transport? Um, something to that effect, that concept, that main idea. If we move on to the next type of a junction, we're going to be looking at adherent junctions. And these collectively fall under the umbrella term adhesions. Okay, Adhesions, adherent junctions, and there's a number of different adhesive types of molecules. Now my adherent junction, if we look here on this side, once again we have this plate right here, if we look at this plate here, this would be found inside, so on the intracellular side of cell 1. And this plate would be on the intracellular side of cell 2. And the paracellular, um, the paracellular region is right here that I'm kind of coloring in this lavenderish color. Okay. And if you take a look at those proteins, I'm hoping what you can kind of visualize is that um, there's a lot of empty space, okay? 
And that empty space is relevant and important. What this, these adhere injunctions do is they kind of act like a, a filter or a colander. If you think about, you know, your spaghetti and your draining spaghetti, they filter out large molecules, preventing them from passing in between the cells. But small molecules such as water and ions can pass through that very quickly and easily. So in this particular example, paracellular transport definitely occurs. And so molecules move in between the two cells, especially small molecules like water, sodium ion, chloride ion, hydrogen ion, bicarbonate ion, and so on and so forth. Okay, those are going to be moving through paracellular transport through the here injunctions. Just a, a quick comment, uh, tight junctions are often referred to, let me go back up here and write it up here, as the brick wall. And you can imagine that, you know, a brick wall is not going to allow things in between the bricks because you've got this mortar in place. Whereas the adherent junctions are often referred to as the picket fence. And of course, if you look at a picket fence, there's space in between these fence, the fence posts and the slats, and so things can get through, small things can get through. The next type of junction, which again falls under the generic umbrella term of adhesion molecules, is the desmosome. Now this is a much tighter link, okay? And this is going to allow very minimal transport in between the cells. Now I do believe water can get through, but, um, in general, it's going to prevent most transport, not all. And you can kind of see, again, from the structure and the way it's drawn, that we have, once again, this plate here is part of cell one, and this plate here is part of cell two. Both of those, so the plate is on the intercellular side of the plasma membrane in cell one, and then the plate is on the intercellular side of the plasma membrane in cell two. And then we have, here we've got cytoskeletal fibers that you can see here being grabbed onto and held together by an assembly of uh, proteins. And then the paracellular space, which you can see right here, there's not a lot of, of space. There's, it's, it's not as tight of a seal as the tight junctions, but it's certainly tighter than the adherent junctions. And so minimal paracellular transport can occur. Um, as, as I mentioned, I think it's really just water and even that's not going to travel super well through that. Okay, and so that's the adherent junk, I'm sorry, that's the desmosomes. The, uh, I think I forgot to mention the protein, uh, um, but anyway, in here the protein is, the coherin is the protein that forms that junction. Um, coherin is also a part of the um, adherent junctions, which I'm hoping that kind of makes you think, wait a second, if we have two types of, co two coherence in both these types of junctions, what else makes the difference? And the answer is the presence of other proteins that are not mentioned here. Okay, moving on to the next type of junction, we're going to be looking at the gap junctions. Now, gap junctions are a little bit different. Uh, adherent junctions, tight junctions, desmosomes are all about keeping the cells connect it to one another and about regulating paracellular transport. Gap junctions are not about regulating paracellular transport at all, and they're really not about keeping the cells physically linked to one another. What they are about is communication. If you look at these gap junctions, what they really are is basically these water-filled channels and so each of these tubes here is essentially a hollow tube. So if I were to look at it, um, take a transverse section, I would see this hollow tube with these proteins on the outside forming this hollow tube, a lot like tubulin, but it's, it's different, okay? And that tube, so you can see the opening of the tube here on each side, so this would be cell one, and you can once again see the tube here and the opening of the tube, and then on the other side, cell two would look similar to that. And what that allows is it allows ions to travel from one cell to the next. Very rapid movement of ions from one cell to the next, back and forth really, 
And this becomes incredibly important when it comes to cells talking to each other. So we'll see these, we'll look at these again. We find these types of junctions, gap junctions exist in smooth muscle cells. They exist in cardiac muscle cells and they provide rapid electrical communication. The electrical communication has to do with the movement of calcium and sodium ions through those channels. Other small molecules can move through, certainly water can move through as well. And then the last junction that I want to, or adhesion molecule that I want to talk about is the hemidesmosomes. And you're going to notice right here that the hemidesmosomes are actually what's going to link the cells. That's the, let's go back up here really quickly, that's the green ones here, okay? Essentially what I was drawing, as I told you, it was very overly simplified simplified, but those would be proteins found in hemi hemidesmosomes. And hemi means half. The structure of a hemidesmosome is very similar to the desmosome, except for in this case we have two sides, one from each cell. Here we just have this side is from the cell itself, and then this is the extracellular matrix. And you can see these connections together. We've got intermediate filaments, by the way, these are also intermediate filaments connecting to each other, and that's actually what holds things down tightly. And so this is why when you scratch your skin, you don't have a whole layer of skin coming off. So super important to their function and job.